Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Math 221 Discrete Structures. So today we're going to cover section 6.4 and section 6.3. So section 6.3 is disproofs and algebraic proofs, and section 6.4 is Boolean algebras, Russell's paradox, and the halting problem. In the textbook I think the author called section 6.3 disproofs, algebraic proofs, and Boolean algebras, but I believe that was actually a typo, so I've changed that. Let's get right into it. So we'll start with section 6.3, disproofs and algebraic proofs. Okay, so disproofs. Last time we learned how to prove an equation is true for all sets. Um, now if you want to prove that an equation is not true for all sets, that's actually easier, because all you have to do is find a counterexample. And then by a counterexample what I mean is some specific sets for which the equation is false. Um, now, Keep in mind that the equation in question could still be true for some sets, it could even be true for most sets, just not for all sets. So because of that it can actually be tricky to think of a counterexample sometimes. So I've given you some options on the, the next slide. Okay, so here are some suggestions for things that you can try for counterexamples. So if your equation involves two sets, A and B, uh, there's basically four different ways that A and B could overlap. So in the first one here, I've given you 1, 2, and 2, 3, and that's a partial overlap between A and B. So try that as your first counterexample, and then if that one is not actually a counterexample, in other words, if it makes the equation true, then try the second one. So the second one here, A is 1, and B is 1 and 2. So that's a total overlap where B contains A. And then if that one doesn't work, you can try the other way around, another total overlap where A contains B. And if none of those work, you can try A and B being uh, completely separate, no overlap at all. So those are the kind of four different ways that A and B could could be in relation to each other. Um, now if your equation involves three sets, A, B, and C, uh, the following counterexample that I've given you here to try is actually based on the concept of having, so let me draw for you the way it would actually look, and this was in the textbook as well. Um, so you have A, B, and C, this is the basic Venn diagram. Uh, for three sets. So you have A contains one and none of the others do. Um, A and B contain two but not C. Um, A contains four as well as C contains four but B does not contain it. So four is there. A contains five, B also contains five, and C also contains five. So five is in all three. Um, let's see what else. B, B contains three but none of the others contain three. So three is there. Uh, do, 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 do. 6 is in B and C but not A, and then finally 7 is only in C. So basically that example with three sets there, that's giving you um, an overlap situation where you've got something in each of the little compartments there. So hopefully that will work as a counterexample, uh, but if it doesn't, you may have to get creative. And um, oftentimes in, in math, like higher math research that I do, um, to write papers and, and publish them and things like a lot of what I do is look for counterexamples and they can be really really difficult to find so you can even have a PhD in math and, and still not be able to find a counterexample. Um, yeah so you might have to get creative. Okay if what you want to disprove is not just an equation but actually an if-then statement then you're still looking for a counterexample but the particular type of counterexample that you're looking for is one where the if part of the statement is true and the then part is false. So that just adds a little extra level of difficulty. All right let's do some examples. Okay let's look at this example. Um, so in this one we're supposed to find a counterexample to show that the statement is false and we assume that all sets are subsets of a universal set U, and I think this one involves U, so we don't have to worry about that. So what we're looking for here is some sets A and B that will make this equation false, and um, hopefully you can see that it should be false because this is like a misapplication of uh, De Morgan's laws. In De Morgan's laws it's the complement of the intersection of A and B that's supposed to be the union of their complements. Okay, so let's just try um, Let's just try the first possible counterexample that I had shown you, where there's a partial overlap. So I'm going to let A be 1 and 2, and B be 2 and 3, and then I'll just check whether this equation is true or not. And so while I'm checking it, the way I'm going to write it is I'm going to put a question mark over the equal sign because I don't know whether it's true or not. Okay, 
and now I'm just going to fill in my choices for what um, B and C were. Oh, I guess I actually lied, didn't I? I said there wasn't a universal set involved, but I think we do need one because we're going to be doing complements, right? So why don't we just make the universal set be um, 1, 2, and 3. You can make it whatever you want, but I think 1, 2, and 3 will be the, the easiest. Okay, so I'm just going to fill in my choices for what A and B were. Sorry, I'm still a sloppy writer, even with a computer. Okay, so now I'm just going to try to calculate what each side is. Okay, so first I'll do the union on the left side. So the union is going to be one, two, three. And then on the right hand side, I'll go ahead and perform the complements. So the complement of one and two, if our universal set is one, two, three, then that just gives me three. And then I'll just leave the union symbol there. And then the complement of two and three will just be one. Okay, now I'll just keep simplifying. So I'll do the complement that's on the left hand side. So the complement of 1, 2, 3, that is the universal set. So the complement is going to be the empty set. So there's just nothing over here. And then on the right hand side, we're doing the union of 3 and 1. So this is 3, 1. Okay, these are not equal. So the following is a counterexample. The one that I started with. So I forgot to write the is a counterexample part. Okay, let's try another example. Okay, so let's look at another example. So in number four here, it's actually an if-then statement. So we're going to need to find a counterexample that makes the if part true and the then part false. So the if part being true, so the intersection of B and C needs to be a subset of A. So let me just see if I can just think of some sets that are like that, that are just little small sets. Um, so let's try making A B, I don't know, um, one, two, three. And then I need to choose B and C so that their intersection is a subset of one, two, three. So let me choose B equals one and two, and then C equals two and three. Um, I might be able to do it with a smaller example than this, but I think this will work. Okay, so that this part makes the if part true. Makes the if part true. Okay, and then let's see if we can find that the then part is false under this um, choice. So now I'm going to write the equation and I'm going to put a question mark in it. And I hope that it is false. If it's not, I'll have to try something else. Okay, so now I'll just fill in my choices. So one, two, three minus 1, 2, intersect 1, 2, 3, minus, wow, that's a really bad bracket, uh, minus 2, 3, and then question mark equals empty set. Okay, so let's see, hmm. So on the left side, I'm going to perform the minus first. So I'm taking away the elements 1 and 2 from 1, 2, 3. So let's see, what is that going to leave me with? That's going to leave me with just 3, I think. And then I have intersection. And then on the right, I have 1, 2, 3, minus 2, 3. So that's 1. Hmm. I think this equation is looking like it's going to be true because the intersection of 1 and 3, the sets containing 1 and 3 is in fact empty. So this is not a counterexample.
Okay, so I have to think of something else. So what I want to do is I want to try to think of an example where I would have had an intersection right here where this would not have been empty. Um, so let me think. Hmm. I think if I had just put another element into A, like if I just put also four into A or something like that, that that, that would have worked. Do you guys see what I mean? Um, let me see if I can actually do this in a different color and just show you. So I think if I would have had comma four here, then I would have had it here, comma four, um, comma four, comma four. So that would not have been taken away. And then it would have also been right here, four. And then I would have had four right here. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, so that I think would have solved the problem and given me a counterexample. So I think a counterexample, and let me see, would that have still made the if part true? Um, do, do, do. So intersection of B and C would have been two and that, yeah, that still would have been a subset of A. Okay, so I think a counterexample that will work here is A equals one, two, three, four. B equals one, two, and then C equals um, two, three. Okay, so this is kind of what you need to do when you're doing these um, counterexample searches. So if you if you get that the first thing you tried was not a counterexample, try to figure out why it wasn't a counterexample and what you could have changed to make it one. All right. So here are two homework problems for you to try. So the first one is just an equation and the second one is an if then statement. So go ahead and give those a try and check the answers in the back of the textbook. Okay, so now let's talk about algebraic proofs. So the types of proofs that we did in the last section, those were called the element method of proof because what we always started with was assuming that X was an element of some set. And then we would usually try to show that X was an element of another set. Um, but there's another way to prove that an equation is true for all sets, and that's to use the set identities that were in theorem 6.2.2. So remember um, what a set identity is. That is an equation involving sets that's true for all sets. And there were 12 of those identities in theorem 6.2.2. So that's a lot of tools there that you can use in that theorem. And so because those identities are true for all sets, you can substitute anything that you want into any of those equations. Like you can substitute B for A and A for B. You can substitute an intersection for A. You can substitute a union for B. You can really substitute anything that you want. So like, for example, um, example. Um, so one of the equations that was there was that um, uh, A union A equals A. I think that was one of them. But if you wanted to, you could sub B for A and get that B union B equals B. And you can do more complicated kind of substitutions like you can sub B intersect C for A and get um, that B intersect C union B intersect C is B intersect C. And then that will be another identity that's true for all sets B and C. So that's really pretty powerful. Um, and you can apply any of those set identities as many times as you want. And basically then you're performing what we would call set algebra. If you're doing algebra on sets, essentially. So let's see if we can do some proofs like that. Okay, so here is the theorem 6.2.2. I've just placed it up there again for you to look at. And uh, let's see if we can do this example using only those 12 things that are in that theorem. So we're trying to show that for all sets A and B, A minus B union A intersect B is equal to A. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So I'm just gonna start with the original equation. Um, I'm gonna use only the left-hand side. Okay, so what you wanna do is start with one side or the other side, it doesn't matter which one, and then slowly, slowly, piece by piece, replace that until it looks exactly like the right-hand side. So I'm starting with the left-hand side. 
And then what I want to do is end with the right hand side. Okay, so let's try and see what we could apply. So what could I do here? So I think one thing I could do is I could replace the minus part. So I have this number 12 down here is a minus b equals a intersect b complement. And that's the only place that the minus appears in, in all of those 12 laws. So I'm going to start with that one. So I'm going to replace a minus b with a intersect b complement. And then this is union a intersect b. And then this is, I'm just going to make a note here that this was the set difference law that I used. OK, let's see what else we can do. OK, so now it looks like what I've got is I've got two intersections that are in parentheses, and then there's a union between them. And both of these start with A. So I think there might actually be a law that is like that. Let me see. Yeah, OK, so over here you see under distributive laws, there's A intersection, A intersection, and then between them is a union. And I've got the same thing over here on my equation. I've got A intersection, A intersection, and then in the middle is a union. OK, and it, it doesn't matter that over here they've used B and they've used C, whereas I have B complement and B. That doesn't matter because you're allowed to substitute in anything that you want for B and C, no matter how weird that substitution is. You can substitute anything you want. So in my case, I'm using B to the B complement instead of B, and I'm using B instead of C, but that's, that's fine. So I can replace what I have with this side as long as I make the same substitution. Okay, so mine is going to start with A intersection, just like the one in the theorem. But then what have I got instead of B? So instead of B, which is here, I have B complement here. Okay, so when I make the replacement instead of B here, I'm going to use B complement. Okay, and then in, in the set law, they use C but I use B in mine, OK? So when I make the replacement from the left-hand side here, instead of writing C, I'm going to write B, OK? So that's going to be B. OK, so that was using the distributive law. OK, so now what have I got? It looks like I'm unioning B complement with B. And I think there's a law about unioning something with its complement. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yep, it's right here. So if I union a set with its complement, I get um, the universal set. And they're calling it A, but I'm going to call it B. And that is fine, because these are laws that are true for all sets. So this is still going to be the universal set. And that is because of complement laws. OK. And then, so now I'm just going to drop the parentheses. OK, and then um, I think there's also a law about intersecting with the universal set. Let's see, where is it? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Here it is. OK, so identity laws. If I intersect with the universal set, that really doesn't do anything, because A is already a subset of the universal set. So this is just going to give me A, and that is the identity law. OK, and now you see that this is, in fact, the right-hand side. So we're done. And I would say the proof ends there. OK, let's look at this next example. This is extremely similar to the last one, um, with the only difference being that there's an intersection in the middle instead of a union. Um, so I'm going to take more or less the same approach and see how it goes. OK, so I'm going to start with the left-hand side, because that's the one that looks like it can be simplified. So I'm just going to write the left-hand side, first of all. OK, and then let me think about what kind of substitutions I can make from my laws. So I'm going to start just like I did last time with the minus part. So I'm going to replace a minus b with a intersect b complement. 
and that's the only change I'm making. And so that is the set difference law. Okay, and now let's see what else we can do. So unlike last time, I had to use the distributive law last time because I had a union in the middle of two intersections, but now I've got three intersections. So I think what I can actually use now is I can use the associative laws. So look over here at the associative laws, the one that has the intersections in it. What those laws are telling you is that it doesn't matter in what order you do intersections, you can move the parentheses around between different intersections to put them wherever you want. And it's the same even though I've got four things and in in um, the way the law is written there's only three things A, B, and C. Um, but I could consider A intersect B to be the C that is over here, for example. And then instead of this B that's right here, I've got B complement. But again, that's fine because these set identities are true for all sets. Okay, so what I can do is I can actually just... Um, I can even just drop these parentheses and just not write them at all because like I said, it's associative. So it doesn't matter in what order you do those. So that is gonna come from associative laws. And then um, notice up at the top here, we have commutative laws for intersections. So you can do an intersection in whatever order you want. And that's true for two sets as it's written in the law, but it's, it's true for any number of sets. Um, so what I can do here is I can also rearrange. So I'm going to put my A's together and I'm going to put B, C, and B together like this. So commutative, commutative laws. Okay, and then um, I can group these again with parentheses if I want to. So I'm going to group my A's together and I'm going to group my A, B, C, and B together. So this is the associative law again. Okay, and now that I have my two A's grouped together, I hope you can see that the intersection of A with itself is just A again. That's the idempotent law. So this is just gonna be A here. And I'll leave the other one alone for now so that I can put the justification on its own line. Okay, and then there's also a rule about um, intersecting a set with its own complement. Let me see, where is that? Here it is. So the complement laws, A intersected with A complement is empty and we're using B instead of A, but that's fine. So this is gonna be the empty set here. So that is the complement laws, complement law, that's one of them. Okay, and then I'm just gonna drop my parentheses. So drop parentheses. Okay, and now what I've got is just A intersected with the empty set, and I think there's a law for that as well, which is right here, the universal bound laws. If I intersect a set with the empty set, I get the empty set. So this is universal bound law. Okay, so this is the right hand side of the equation. So I've proven that the left hand side equals the right hand side. So that is the proof. Okay, so here are three homework problems for you to try um, using the same technique that I just showed you. So go ahead and give those a try. And then I think the quiz next time will probably be on this technique where you'll have a little drop down menu and you'll have to fill in the, the reasons for each step. Okay, section 6.4, Boolean algebras, Russell's paradox, and the halting problem. So there's some really um, kind of advanced and, and also interesting material in this section. So let's get right into it. Okay, so first I wanna talk about the difference between sets and logic. So back when we were doing logic, we had a theorem called theorem 2.11, and that listed a whole bunch of different logical equivalencies, and they all had their different names. And um, those were equivalencies that were true for any logical statements, P, Q, and R. 
And then we recently had theorem 6.2.2 that listed set identities that are true for any sets. And what you can see here is I've shown you in this table, um, this is comparing the logical equivalencies and the set identities, is that these are really, really similar. In fact, they're almost identical. So if we look, for example, at the first one here, we have P instead of A, and then we have Q instead of B, and then we have, um, here we have OR instead of UNION. But other than that, those are the only differences. So if you would even do just like a find and replace thing in Microsoft Word and you just replaced all the instances of P with A and all the instances of Q with B and R with C, and then if you would replace OR with UNION and replace AND with intersection, and then replace um, negation like right here, if you would replace negation with complement, you'll find that these laws are exactly the same. And the only other equivalencies I think are, let's see, um, this thing, which is a contradiction. In other words, that's a, a logical statement that's always false. That corresponds to the empty set. And tautology, which is a logical statement that's always true, the T thing, that corresponds to the universal set. Um, so yeah, this is quite interesting. So what you're seeing is that the laws for the way that logic work and the laws for the way that sets work are actually exactly the same. And so because they're exactly the same, um, this guy called George Boole came along in the 1800s and he wanted to kind of abstractify the concept of both of these structures, the structure of logic and the structure of sets. And he wanted to literally make them the exact same thing. So he invented this thing called a Boolean algebra. And I'm gonna tell you about that now. So a Boolean algebra, it's defined as a set whose elements obey the same laws as logical statements or as sets. So both sets and logical statements are themselves Boolean algebras. And in a Boolean algebra, the only difference that it has from logic or from sets is that you use different symbols. So you use the symbol plus instead of either union or um, the or conjunction in logic. You use multiplication symbol, this dot, instead of intersection or and. And then you use an over bar, like you write this bar over a letter, instead of using the complement superscript or instead of negation in logic. And then you use zero instead of either the empty set or uh, contradiction. And then you use one instead of universal set or tautology in logic. Uh, so that's that's uh, the abstracted concept that he came up with to be able to talk about logic and sets at the same time. And keep in mind that even though Boolean algebras use the symbols plus multiplication zero and one, these are not the same symbols as you know from other math. Like zero in this context is not an integer. One is not an integer. Plus does not really mean plus and multiplication does not really mean multiplication. It means something different. And so what it actually means is laid out on the next slide. Okay, so this is our technical um, formal definition of a Boolean algebra. So it's simply a set B together with two operations, which are generally denoted with plus and with dot or multiplication. And these operations and the set are defined in such a way that for all elements A and B in big B, both a plus b and a times b are in b, and these plus and multiplication operations have the same have the following properties. So there's the commutative laws. So for all a and b in big B, a plus b equals b plus a, and a times b equals b times a. So you can compare that to the fact that in sets, it doesn't matter what order you do a union in, and it doesn't matter what order you do an intersection in. Same for logic um, with or and and. Uh, then we have the associative laws. So for all a, b, and c in b, uh, it does not matter what order you do addition in, and it also doesn't matter what order you do multiplication in. That's also true for regular addition and multiplication. Um, and it's also true for unions, and it is true for intersections, it's true for ors, it's true for ands. Okay, distributive laws. So this is the one where it gets really weird, and you can actually tell that you're not dealing with normal addition and multiplication. So for all a, b, c in b, a plus the quantity of b times c is equal to a plus b 
times a plus c. So that is not a thing that's true with normal addition and multiplication, but it is something that's true about unions and intersections, and it is also true about ors and ands. And so we also have this the other way around. So that last one, that was showing that addition distributes over multiplication. So basically addition distributes to both of those things in there. And then the other way around, multiplication distributes over addition, okay? Um, so that one is normally true with addition and multiplication, but the one that's normally not true is this part A. That's super weird. <laughs> and if you like how super weird that is, then you should take abstract algebra because all of the operations in that class are weird like that. Okay, next one is the identity laws. So this is about the purpose of what the zero and the one are, which remember those correspond to empty set and universal set or to a contradiction or a tautology. So there exist distinct elements 0 and 1 in B, such that for all A in B, A plus 0 equals A, and A times 1 equals A. So that's kind of the same as like how normal um, addition of 0 and multiplication of 1 work. Um, but keep in mind that what this, what this is really standing for is something like A unioned with the empty set, or A intersected with the universal set. Okay, and then finally the complement laws. So for each A in B, there exists an element in B denoted A bar, and that is called either the complement or the negation of A. So remember in set theory, we call it the complement, and in logic, we call it the negation. And the properties of that A bar thing are that if you do A plus A bar, you get one, and if you do A times A bar, you get zero. And that's corresponding to the idea that, for example, um, if you union a set with its complement, you get the universal set, that's like this one. And if you intersect a set with the empty set, or sorry, if you intersect a set with its complement, then you get the empty set. That's what that one is um, similar to. Okay, so those are the properties of a Boolean algebra, and they're, they're rather interesting. Um, they might not look too useful to you at, at first glance, but these are some uh, rules and structures that kind of play in the background of theoretical computer science and uh, allow people to, to write theorems about computer science. Okay, so once you have defined a Boolean algebra, uh, there are many things that you can derive just from that definition. There are lots of different things that you could prove. So one thing you could prove is that each element's complement is unique. So that A bar thing, it's, it's unique to A. Um, the quantities 0 and 1 are unique. There's not more than one 0 or more than, more, more than one 1. And then you can also do identities that are analogous to theorem 2.11 and theorem 6.22. And those are shown in this table here. So all of these can be proven and derived just from the definition that was on the last slide. Uh, just in the same way that you can prove them for sets and, and for logic. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say about Boolean algebra. Um, this might be a concept that you encounter again in another computer science or math class. But now I want to talk about something completely different, which is Russell's paradox. So this is, um, this is quite interesting, and it's just basically a thought experiment. So let me walk you through these, these thoughts here. So let's think about the concept of sets as elements of themselves. So I asked you a lot of true-false questions uh, back in the beginning of the class. For example, I asked you questions like, you know, is A an element of the set containing A? Um, is the set containing A an element of the set containing A? And questions like that. So you've already thought maybe a little bit about these types of concepts, but probably not in much depth unless you had been doing some of the journal readings. So most sets are not elements of themselves. Uh, for example, the set of all integers is not an integer itself. So the set of all integers is not an element of itself, because if it were, then it would have to be an integer. And another example could be that the set of all horses is not a horse. Um, I would quite like to see the set of all horses kind of, you know, running around and galloping and prancing. That would be funny. Uh, but the set of all horses is not, in fact, a horse. On the other hand, there are some things that could be elements of themselves. So for example, the set of all abstract ideas is an abstract idea, is it not? So that's interesting. Um, so back in the uh, early 1900s, this guy called Bertrand Russell, as, as well as 
quite a few other theoretical mathematicians um, started thinking really deeply about the idea of set theory and whether set theory was um, internally consistent, whether it was logically consistent with itself. And so some of these thoughts that he was having back then led to Russell's paradox. So now I'm going to describe Russell's paradox for you. Okay, so this was discovered, or, or rather it was published by Bertrand Russell in 1919. So define S to be the set of all sets which are not elements of themselves. So S is the set of all sets satisfying the condition that they are not elements of themselves. Then you can ask, is S an element of itself? So if you ask that question, it's quite interesting because the answer is neither yes nor no. So the reason the answer is neither yes nor no is, is for the following reasons. So suppose that S is an element of itself. So one of the conditions for being an element of S, in order to be an element of S, you must be a set that is not an element of yourself. So if S were an element of itself, then S would actually fail the condition to be in S. So that would make it impossible for S to be an element of itself. So you get a contradiction. Now suppose on the other hand that S is not an element of itself. So if S is not an element of itself, then S actually passes the condition to be an element of S. So that would make it an element of itself. Hmm. So at this point you're like, what? Um, so both the supposition that S is an element of S and S is not an element of S, they both lead to contradictions. So neither can be the case. So what do you conclude in that case? Um, well, the only thing you can really conclude is that S cannot exist as described. The set we described as S must not exist. There is no set of all sets which are not elements of themselves. You would think that you could just write down any set, but you can't. So there are a lot of other similar paradoxes to Russell's paradox. It's certainly not the only one. Um, you can even write a really short paradox by just saying, this statement is false. So if you think about the truth value of the statement, this statement is false, it can't be true because if, what it, if it was true, then what it was saying would be true, but it's saying that it's false. So that would be a contradiction. But it also can't be false because if it were false, then what it was saying would be false, but what it's saying is that it's false. So if you think about that one for long enough, I think you'll see it's a paradox. There's also the well-known barber paradox, which is about men shaving themselves. You can look that one up. And if you're really interested in this topic and you think it's fun, um, there's a book called Logic Comics, which is actually a graphic novel or a comic book uh, on the journal readings page. That's one of my favorite books. And it's all about Bertrand Russell and his discoveries. So please read that if you think that's interesting. Um, now this discovery of Russell, it led to a lot of other strange discoveries in logic and set theory back in that time period of the early uh, 1900s. So for example, one of the most monumental and pivotal discoveries of all time in mathematics is this one. In 1931, Kurt Gödel proved that there are some mathematical statements which, although they have a truth value, you cannot prove them and you also cannot disprove them. <laughs> You might think that all the mathematicians went home and cried on that day, but <laughs> I think we actually found that really, really exciting, really fascinating. Um, so there's a great book called Gödel Escher Bach, which I think I noted on the journal page. That is widely considered to be the best book for a popular audience, in other words, for non-mathematicians that has ever been written about math. And unfortunately, I've never read it, but you guys should try reading that if you're interested. Okay, so you might think that previous discussion of paradoxes is it's all kind of highfalutin but not very useful, um, but it actually is pretty useful. So here's an example of why it's useful. You guys know Alan Turing is the uh, modern pioneer of computer science. So in the first half of the 20th century, um, he was developing the foundations of modern theoretical computer science. And he was also a code, bar uh, excuse me, a code breaker for the British against the Nazis. Um, he used a similar argument to Russell to prove the following result, which is quite useful. So this theorem 6.4.2, this tells us that there is actually no way to check whether a computer program will run forever or whether it will terminate in a finite amount of time. You cannot write a computer algorithm that will input any other algorithm in any data set and then tell you whether that computer algorithm that you inputted is going to run forever or whether it will terminate. So that is, that is quite useful, actually. Um, 
obviously you can just run the computer program and see what happens, but you can't run it forever. So, all right, well, that brings us to the end of section 6.4, and uh, there is actually no homework that I've assigned for this section, so I've just kind of, I've kind of tricked you into listening to it and, and learning about it, even though there's no homework. <laughs> so congratulations, uh, you learned something. And if you're interested in these topics that I've discussed, I hope you will check those journal readings out. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up here uh, for today. And uh, like I said, next time's quiz will be on the section 6.3 material. It'll probably be a fill in the blanks proof. And uh, maybe I'll throw a counter example question on there as well. All right, thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you next time. <laughs>